All right, Steve. If you want to switch the volume, there's a volume on this keyboard up at the top. Okay. If you have a hard time here. Isn't this fun? Hey, look at the background. Looks like you're worm fishing somewhere. <laughs> How was your falcon deal? The what? Yeah, uh, you went falconing? Oh yeah. Yeah, I went up, I went up to Bishop. I can and, only see uh, the top of your head. There we go. We flew a couple of peregrines. And then I got to fish for a couple hours on the Owens River, which I've never seen before. Well, it's it's a beautiful river, absolutely gorgeous. Wasn't much happening, but I, I did catch a couple of fish. Um, this doesn't last very long. We've got about 15 minutes of material that they're going to take out of that. So I've got a number of questions and and uh, feel free to expand on whatever you want. But it's it's not a very lengthy interview. All right. So you can go surfing or if you haven't had your coffee yet, you can. <laughs> Whatever's on the day's agenda, right? Nothing on it. <laughs> it's going to rain here, I think. Oh, is it? Yeah, I hope. Man, we have, we're in a terrible drought. Well, we're 60% of normal right now. I mean, it's like, it's horrible here. It's going to be 61 degrees tomorrow. We've had a half an inch for the year. Wow. Well, if you get some rain, send it our way. Share a little, please. Yeah. <laughs> Although I don't know if there's enough to go around anymore, unless you live in Texas, right? Yeah. Right. <laughs> All right. You good? Yeah. So first off, on uh, behalf of the Henry Spork Foundation, I want to thank you for your time and um, joining us on the interview. As always, your support um, is greatly appreciated. Um, for those listening, um, as the founder of Patagonia, Yvonne, obviously you need little introduction. However, your company is known for great products, but more importantly, Patagonia sets the standard for responsible environmental and sustainable business practices and donates millions annually to protect and preserve life on earth. I think that's probably more important to you than anything that you do. Um, you're also world renowned for your climbing accomplishment. You surf still to this day and are a skilled fly fisher, which I can attest to. Um, and at this stage of the game, you have a long and admirable resume, I would say, but I got a feeling you're not done yet, given all the world's challenges that we're faced with. Um, Although the roots of Patagonia are firmly planted in climbing world, and that's kind of the origins and of your company, you've probably been fishing as long or longer than you've been climbing. Is that true? Yeah, I, I first started fishing when I was six years old, I think, back in Maine, where I was born. And uh, I got hooked, I think, on my first day, probably. I went out with my brother fishing for pickerel and I guess he caught one and snuck it on my line without me seeing it to make <laughs> believe that I caught it. So, you know, the Zen master would say, you know, just who got hooked here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> were you fly fishing at the time or were you? Uh, no, that was just, I don't know what we were using, bait or something. So and then, how did you end up fly fishing? Who introduced you to that? Well, well I, I used to climb a lot in the Wind River Range and in the Tetons and stuff. And every time I'd go into the mountains, I'd carry a little spinning rod with me with super duper lures and just, to, you know, to sport and to eat fish. And one day I was in the, in the Tetons walking by the, the, the mountain guide shack and Glenn Exum, you know, the, who was the mountain guide, that was his guide service. He was teaching his son, Eddie Hexum, how to fly cast. And I was, I was there barefooted and, you know, just shorts on and, and I was watching and Glenn Hexum just said, hey, son, come on over here. So I went over and he taught me how to cast and that was it. I, I went out and got a spin fish, a spin fly rod so you could Put either reel on. Yeah. Started with that, and then, you know, I haven't spin fish since really. Strictly fly. 
you and I kind of had, we talked about this the other day, a similar path. And I used to ride my bike out to a pond and bass and bluegill fish. And, you know, originally I started with a spinning rod and, and, and that was my introduction into fishing, which I was just, I mean, I couldn't get enough of it um, growing up. And whether it was the water or the fish on the end of the line, I mean, it was all exciting. And they happened to have a fly rod out there. And at the time I didn't know it was a fly rod and, and I didn't know there was such a thing as fly fishing, but I picked this thing up and um, it was a Shakespeare wonder rod with a Perrine automatic reel on it. And once I started casting the fly line, it was like, that's all I ever wanted to do. I never picked up a spinning rod after that. Yeah. And then I think I had the same rod as you started with. I had an Eagle Claw spin fish, which was better for probably, you know, steak and tomatoes than it was for actually casting a fly line. <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, before that, I mean, when I, we moved to Maine when I was about seven, and I would sneak onto a Bob Hope's uh, golf course, and he had a bass pond there and full of bluegills and bass. And, and we would buy a bamboo pole and we call it, they were called Calcuttas. You'd go into the sports shop and buy a Calcutta. And then, we, you know, we'd put worms and line on the end and stuff and fish. So I did that when I was, you know, before the other kids could cross the creek, I was sneaking into this, this pond. So, so I've, I've fished all my life. I mean, I've never stopped. So one of the things I like about fishing, and, and you're probably in the same mold, um, is that after a while, you can kind of mold and shape it to what you like about it. Um, and whether that's the way you fish, um, the gear you use, where you fish. Um, for you, um, do you have a certain aspect of it that continues to motivate you and um, you still travel all over the world pursuing different species and whatnot and are very motivated to fish obviously yeah i well i've been trying to simplify my fly fishing and as much as i could i mean i for a while there i really got into tenkara fishing yeah What I learned from, I mean, what keeps me fishing is, that, is if I can learn something every day I go out. Yeah. So I learned a lot with a Tenkara because uh, it has such a good feel that you can impart action to your fly. And I believe that of all the things that are important for a fly, whether it's color or shape or or whether it's named after somebody or whatever. The most important thing I think is action. And I think, you know, if you're getting refusals when you're dry fly fishing, it's probably because they're taking emergers. But yeah. if you're fishing emergers, you never get refusals. <laughs> <laughs> unless, unless it's spent spinners. Unless it's on the Henry's fork. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I found that uh, if you really want to catch fish, just imitate emergers. And so I use a lot of soft hackles, uh, probably 80% of the time, soft hackles. And I don't, I don't swing them. In fact, they're, they should be called soft hackle emergers. Hmm. I do everything I possibly can not to swing them. And I try to get them in front of Trout's nose and I give it a tiny little twitch and it, and that's the trigger that really it makes it effective. And so I, I've got my, I, I spent a whole year with just a pheasant tail and partridge soft hackle fishing all over the world. I, I caught Atlantic salmon with it. I caught bonefish. In fact, it's the best bonefish fly I've ever used. Huh. Uh, and I, I caught steelhead, I caught every trout. And it's kind of like, you know, Craig Matthews has a fly called a sparkle dun. He so does. When there's duns out, you can imitate every mayfly by just changing the color and the size. Really simple. And yeah. yet you look at, you know, you walk into a fly shop and there's a bazillion flies and 
and uh, his catalogs. I mean, everybody <laughs> comes up with a tiny little version of something and names it after themselves. And and I'm I go in the opposite, the exact opposite way. I'm trying to limit the amount of flies that I have, <clears throat> and and learn more about each fly rather than try to you know have 2000 flies in my vest i got the opposite problem i'm a junkie <laughs> it's like i can't walk in a fly shop without buying flies because i'm always looking for like the fly <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I might get there i might get there one day i definitely have limited the number of fish I catch. Like I don't need to go catch fish. It's like I need to catch that one fish, right? The one I can't catch. I'm always <laughs> looking that that's but I think I think in your answer, um something I overlooked and it was really a great answer, the fact that as long as you can keep learning something, right, you're you're motivated. And I think that that's one of the things in fly fishing that I've always feel is there and, and never goes away. There's always something to learn, whether it's a simple observation of nature. And I think as you kind of go down this path that um, for me anyway, it's imitating not only nature, but understanding its environment and how it's all connected and the role that that plays in whatever species you may be fishing for. And then you kind of, I think it not only increases your success, but also, you know, helps your approach and everything else. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And I, I think, you know, you can learn more and more about less and less, or you can learn more and more about more and more. And I, <laughs> Is that a short know, artism? <laughs> I, I, was, I was fishing with, uh, with Nelson on, on uh, Henry's Fort one day and I said, what's, what's happening? Uh, you know, what's going to be happening today? And he said, well, the good news is they're taking, uh, they're taking trichos. The bad news is they're only taking the females. <laughs> I, I said, what? Yeah, he says the females have a little tiny white dot on the butt and you got to imitate that. Otherwise they won't. Well, <laughs> I, I came up with a fly last year that is a, uh, basically, a uh, a zebra midge, but with a soft hackle, and uh, and with a uh, olive green body, and tied in a size twenty two, black. It imitates either a midge or a trico, and it, it kills the even when there is only um, spent spinners on the water, they still take that fly. And uh, I sent I sent one to Craig the other day, Craig Matthews, and he he said in thirty minutes he landed six fish with it. Wow! With uh, you know a lot of midges out. So I, so now I got you know one fly that has two purposes, kind of. Nelson and I would get along. <laughs> <laughs> um, speaking of people. Um, who were your influences when you were fishing? Do you have any mentors and and um, that really kind of um, had an effect on your current philosophies in the direction that you're headed? Um, not really. I mean, I always fish by myself pretty much. So, yeah. you know, I, I, I haven't fished with any. Um, early on, I, I was just by myself, but uh but probably Sylvester Neems had a big influence just in that reading what he's written and that he was a soft tackle fanatic. Yeah. And, and, uh, and so, yeah, that, that's probably had my, the most influence. Um, since you've fished and climbed all your life, did fishing and your experiences help mold kind of your environmental um, and business philosophies as climbing did? Well, um, you know, back, back to simplicity. I mean, you know, I've done like 
I don't know, six or seven routes on El Capitan, including two first ascents. And those two first ascents each took like 10 days. And now, you know, guys are soloing these routes. Right. And which I feel like this is the way sport or passion or whatever should go. Instead of getting more and more complex, more and more technological, you should refine the methods to more and more simple. And so for me, you know, the ultimate in climbing is a naked guy, barefooted, <laughs> you know, climbing like an ape. And the further you get away from that, the more you use, you know, sticky rubber or chalk on your hands and, and bolts and all of that, the further you're getting away from the real essence of climbing. I mean, you know, the best climbers in the world are the apes and orangutans and stuff. Yeah. And, you know, we're, we're, we are apes. So anyway, that's been always my philosophy in climbing and, and I'm trying to do that with fishing as well. I, I, I uh, I'm trying to simplify and, but learn more and more about what I'm doing. And, and in fact, there are times when I'm doing something, fishing soft hackles and imparting some motion to them in such a way that I can't describe what I'm doing to somebody. Hmm. It's a little like these celestial navigators. Right. You know, in Polynesia that can navigate just by feel around the world. If you ask them how do they know to go in that direction, they wouldn't be able to talk to you. It's a seat of the pants thing. And, and that's a deep knowledge that I th I'm striving for in fishing. I, I think you're exactly right there. I get frustrated with, you know, these days, the amount of information that's out there, people don't really learn anything. They just want to be told, like they want to be told, like, where do I go fish? What fly do I use? You know, they never ask questions past, here's the fly you use and you go there. You know, they never ask like, what time of day? What kind of weather's good, right? You know, what's, how do I optimize the experience that I'm possibly looking for? Um, and I felt that probably you as well, when, and I used to fish by myself quite a bit also, that it was that whole act of discovery that not only made it so fascinating, but also made the journey so rewarding. Yeah, you're absolutely right. When, when somebody tells you something, it's not nearly as valuable as if you discover it yourself. Right. I mean, I love it, you know, and, and you probably heard this story too, when I'd fish down in the Keys for tarpon, guides would tell us like these guys would show up in the boat with the GPS, right? And it's like, <laughs> You're out of here. Do you, what do you think? I'm going to go show you all my spots and then you're going to pin them and then I'm going to find you here tomorrow. Right. You know, where that guide and, and a lot of those, especially the early guides down in the Keys or in any fishing environment, you know, they put the time in. Right. You know, it was years and a lifetime of experiences to find these places and to understand why, you know, fish behaved or showed up in certain areas at certain times and stuff. And to just show up with a GPS and pin it, you know, and run there the next day on your own. I mean, it's like, yeah, it, it, it's the process is kind of a lot of that's been taken away these days or it just doesn't exist. Well, being an old falconer, I think I'm going to train an osprey to spot bonefish for me. <laughs> <laughs> You're pretty good at it. I know, I know that. <laughs> Um, I got a couple of more questions, and if you don't mind, and um, I could talk to you all day. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather go fishing. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> <nothing else to do. laughs> I know. I wish it was in person. You know, I wish we were sitting on a bank somewhere. That'd be a lot more fun. But it is what it is, right? Yeah. Um, um, Patagonia. Um, when you got into fishing products, or or as, as far as like product categories in general, obviously you, you know, there's a need to sell product um, and, and your company quality is, and 
the duration that those products are usable is very important to you. What other motivations go into and decisions go into when you look at like fishing, for example? Because it's obviously for you not just about selling something. It's it's a much bigger picture than that. Well, uh, I think I think uh, you know you know, our fishing line is very small, and we just we just told ourselves that we're not going to come out with any product that we don't use ourselves. And so if we make a certain pack, we only make one and try to perfect that pack and not give, not come out with 10 packs and give, let the angler decide which one he wants. We're just going to perfect one pack and then that's it. And, um, and, you know, we used to have more waiter style of waiters than we have now. We've narrowed it way down. Um, so it's it's a very small line. But we, by perfecting the product also means that uh, we try to make it as responsible as possible. So, you know, we use as, as many recycled materials as we can. Uh, we make everything so that it can be recycled. Uh, and uh, does your ability to to have a voice in the community come into that? You know, and 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 especially if you look at our cold water resources, the challenges they're faced with. So as as you look at a category or a product line in specific, especially if 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 it's a new venture for you, is is playing a role in that regard also come into that decision-making process? Well, yeah, I mean, we, you know, we changed our mission statement a couple of years ago to simply say we're in business to save our home planet. Yeah. And I mean, it, it may, may sound like bullshit to some people, but it's, we're, we're dead serious about it. And so the fishing team had to ask, okay, what does that mean for us? And so they're very much concerned with uh, rivers and, and flowing water. And then, then, you know, I make stuff for surfers and, and they're into the saving the planet in, in the way that they can influence it. And so, you know, we have ambassadors for surfers, right, for surfing, but they're not, they're not these guys that are out competing and, and going to the Olympics next year. They're not, you know, monkeys on a string. They're, they actually are hired as ambassadors for surfing. First of all, they're good surfers, but they're there to influence young people to protect our planet. So they're hired for different reasons than a normal surf business. And it's the same with, with fishing. Um, also on your website, as I was kind of browsing it the other day, um, you write as business unusual, uh, which is the, the way you conduct your business. I mean, that's a very true and profound statement. Um, but in that opening paragraph, Patagonia simply states that life on earth is under the threat of extinction. And many even the vast majority of those who fish don't realize that fishing cold water resources are in the crosshairs of this extinction. Um, I know you're frustrated by that, you know, the number of people that, that actually realize and, and take this to heart. Um, but I mean, you look at the Henry's Fork Foundation, which we're here on behalf of um, today, the Madison, all the cold water fisheries that we have come to know throughout the world are being threatened right now. Um, and then you and I recently had a discussion about what's, what's really at the tipping point right now are wild salmon and steelhead. And, um, you know, the, the, the threat to them and the challenge that they are faced with this, at this point in time, it, it may be irreversible. Um, and I know you and your company have given tons not only in money, but in time 
um, to, to remove dams, to do a number of things to try to preserve the, the last remaining wild stocks of these fish. Do you think there's a chance at this point? Uh, <laughs> that's, I, I mean, bump, it's- I bum it, everybody out, but- uh, No, I mean, I, it's like, cause it's the reality of it. Like we don't really talk about like, I mean, yeah. it, we, we are at the tipping point if we haven't even passed the tipping point for some of these species and that should hit, I mean, that should affect everyone. Well, you know, it's, I mean, every year is less and less steelhead. Let's just keep it with steelhead. And this year in the Olympic Peninsula and stuff, nobody's catching anything. There's only one river that has a somewhat healthy run of steelhead and it's a river that has no hatchery fish. All the other rivers that have hatchery fish have crashed. No one's catching anything. I have a, Dylan Tomine, my friend, he's been out, I don't know how many times, hasn't caught a single steelhead. It's, it's uh, it, part of the reason is the hatchery programs, which are dumbing down the species. Yeah. Another reason is the rivers are polluted and dammed and stuff. But another one is that there's just a big glob of hot water out there, which means no nutrients for the fish. And then you've got every country in the Pacific sending out millions and millions of hatchery smolts, and there's not enough food for all of them. And uh, so, you know, the wild fish are starving along with the, uh, the hatchery fish. So I ran into a, a biologist probably, a, well, it was a decade ago, at least up in British Columbia. We were sitting on the bank one day and we started talking about the health of the fisheries and that part of the world and steelhead populations, as you know, are, are, do not have or been influenced by hatchery fish. So there's some of the last, especially in the Skeena system, uh, the Stikine are some of the last remaining wild stocks left in the world. Um, and at that time, he told me, especially coastal steams were in total crash. And then obviously, as you know, um, we both share a love for fishing those rivers up there the last few years in particular, the crash in steelhead, wild steelhead populations have been alarming. I think last year, the number of fish returning was down 60%. Um, so considering they don't have hatchery influence or, or, or other species being in or subspecies being introduced um, to threaten them, that speaks to the environmental problem as a whole, especially the oceans and other stuff that's going on. But that to me really like, wow, this, this is, you know, this is really concerning. Well, it, it's, it's with every mammal, you know, it, thankfully some of them are able to go further north, some of them further higher up, higher altitudes, the Chinook salmon now are naturalizing streams in the Arctic. Huh. Clear around, you know, the top part of North America. Right. Uh, I still fish Atlantic salmon in Labrador, Northern Labrador, and it's fantastic. But Maine, forget it. Yeah. You know, and even, even uh, the maritime provinces in Canada, they're crashing like crazy. So they're all up in Labrador now and, and uh, Russia, Northern Nicola Peninsula is still really good fishing. Although they're gonna mess that up with fish farms now. Um, well, it looks like Puget Sound, they're getting some of their fish farms removed. I mean, there is some move in the direction and especially in when it comes to fish farms to hopefully reduce the number of those or keep new ones from being implemented because they definitely have an impact on especially um, our coastal fish. Um, I got one last question for you and it's a tough one. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think we're going to end on a good note, right? <laughs> <Just> like, <laughs> right. <laughs> so, and I think about this all the time and especially as I get older, but if, if you had one last place to fish where would it be oh oh my god 
I, I can dumb it down to two. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'd like to go to the Seychelles, but I, but it's so expensive. I, you know, I, I may be a millionaire, but I'm still a dirt bag, and I just <laughs> can't justify spending twenty five thousand dollars a week plus airfare to go catch some bonefish, and I just. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, huh? so uh, you know I, I'd rather spend that money and doing some good with it. So, uh, but but that would be one place I'd like to go. I mean, bonefish, bonefish are just about my favorite fish these days. Huh? I, I really guess that. I really well. Lefty Cray said the same thing. Hmm. I, talked to him about that. And he said bonefish are his favorite fish. And you know, it's because it's a combination of hunting and fishing. Right. And after staring at, you know, looking for bonefish all day, there are times when I can feel the left side of my brain switch over to my right side. Because when I'm looking for funny water, I use a certain side of my brain. When I'm looking for shadows, or movement, it's and it, it's kind of like it's a little Zen <laughs> contemplation thing where you're concentrating so hard. Pretty soon, uh, you relax and and you can feel your brain go back and forth, and that's it's pretty cool. It's it's a good. I've never felt it any other time. Huh? I get that with steelhead fishing. I mean, if I had one thing to do, it'd be swinging flies for steelhead you know and especially in british columbia just the landscape and the wildlife that still exists there and stuff it's it's uh, you know it does something for me that nothing else does but have you, you have had... those moments like you know like what you were describing like you know when you're going to catch a fish like when you are relaxed and have that zen or whatever you want to call it you know when i mean by the cast Right. You know, yeah. it's like and before it even happens, you have this sense. It's like you're going to get your bell rung here. Right. And and that's a, it doesn't happen all the time, but that's a pretty magical moment. Well, you know, I I I fish with a I was down in Patagonia and I was with a, a gaucho dog. And there was a pool with Chinook salmon that would break the surface like every 15 minutes. And. 30, 30 seconds before a salmon would break the surface, the, run, the dog would run over to the water and go on point. Then all of a sudden the salmon breaks. What's with that? You know? <laughs> I mean, they're a, little, they're a little more attuned than we are to. <laughs> they've got deep knowledge, or maybe they can, you know, before the, the salmon will break the service they I think they vibrate a little bit and then they come up and I think that the dog can tell that from 30 feet down hmm. I mean that's we'll get there someday but it's gonna take a lot more fish. <laughs> I don't know that the direction we're headed we're gonna get that there'll be a few maybe <laughs> but I kind of have a sense we're drifting somewhere else right we're gonna pull it up on an app right and it goes up oh, here they come He's yeah. gonna, Right. <laughs> right. With our drones. <laughs> I remember we were once taking a photograph of a steelhead for this gentleman to carve. And so we put it in an aquarium. And so this the fish had a mark on one of its sides. And so we kept flipping it around in the tank. So it was facing downstream. And although this tank didn't have any current to it, this fish, as soon as we would turn it around, it would flip back so it was facing upstream. You know, <laughs> and it's like, and obviously it was light or, you know, where the light was coming from, but yeah, it was just a still aquarium. And and and, and not once could we get it to sit properly in, or the way we wanted it to in the tank. Every time we got it to face downstream, it would flip upstream. So that was pretty cool to watch. That was a neat experience. Well, it's, it's you know, it, you get those days where you can walk up to a pool table and run the table. Yeah. And as soon as you start thinking, you can't make a shot. No. <laughs> well, on that note, 
that's all I've got. I really appreciate your time. I really enjoyed it. And uh, you going to go out and catch a wave or two today or what's on the agenda? No, it's pretty cold and south wind today. So I'm, I'm holed up inside, but I'll, I'll be heading for Argentina, hopefully in two weeks. I got my, I got my vaccine and I'm ready to go, but I hope I, I hope I make it. Yeah, I do too. They could use some company down there. I talked to Augie the other day. He's super excited that possibly you guys are going to be able to come down and join him. So say hello to him for me. All right. Thanks. All righty. Hey, thank you very much. You take care. Yeah. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. Likewise. Okay.